We go to the phones. Republican strategist Matt McCoviak joining us. Matt, good morning. How are you today? Hey, Chad. I'm doing great. Good morning. Well, glad to have you on the program, Matt. Uh, let's. I, I, I guess you know impeachment still obviously the big news uh, nationwide. Uh, it, it looks as though Mitch McConnell has uh, rejected Chuck Schumer's op- opening offer on the impeachment trial. For, for those who, who don't know how this is going to be operating once you know we, we get through with the House, how does this work in the Senate? Uh, and, and what is this offer that uh, was, was uh, thrown out there from Chuck Schumer to Mitch McConnell? Yeah, it was a little bit like an opening ante or an opening bid. You know, you start with, you know, 100% of what you want, 0% of what they want. You hope you end up somewhere in the middle. You know, the interesting thing, the, the debate in the Senate is going to be over whether there are additional witnesses who testify before the Senate uh, or not. And it appears the Senate Republican leadership wants a quick trial, wants no new witnesses, wants to basically use the evidence the House received. Uh, they'll allow, you know, the impeachment managers to present their case. They'll allow the White House to present its defense. Uh, and then presumably they would go ahead and vote. And so that would take, you know, one or two weeks instead of a three or four or five week trial. The important thing to understand is the witness, you know, the, the, the vote on witnesses is a 51 vote threshold. The vote on removal from office is a two thirds or 67 vote threshold. So if you had all 47 Democrats band together to, you know, uh, to vote to, to remove Trump from office, you need uh, 20 Republican senators to join with him. The other timing thing that's here, that here that's important in terms of sequencing, Brad, uh, is that the, the, the issue of uh, the timing in, in the sense that the witness vote doesn't occur until after both sides have presented their case. Mm. So th- this isn't even going to be taken up until January. You'll have a, a week or 10 days where both sides present their case. And then you would have the 51 vote threshold on witnesses. What Schumer has said, uh, Chad, is that he wants, you know, he wants Mulvaney, the chief of staff. He wants John Bolton, the former national security advisor. Uh, you know, he wants you know, access to people that didn't testify uh, on the House side because of the executive privilege claim. And yesterday it appeared that Senate Republicans, including some of the more moderate members, really didn't respond very well to Schumer's uh, basically, you know, press statement. So if Pierre Schumer and McConnell are meeting privately today, they'll begin some of those uh, conversations and those negotiations. The reason the Senate Republicans don't want a long trial with lots of witnesses is McConnell sees it as, so, as quote unquote, mutually assured destruction. You know, for every, uh, you know, whistleblower or Hunter Biden you get on, on the Republican side, you're going to have to give up someone like John Bolton or Mick Mulvaney or someone else. And those are new witnesses that would have new testimony. It would add new variables into this whole debate. And I think right now Republicans feel like they're winning uh, politically and in, and, and in public opinion. And so they'd rather just take the win rather than risk, uh, you know, new uncertain witnesses testifying to new things. Yeah. Uh, Matt, uh, there was a story out, uh, I guess, beginning last week that there were going to be uh, maybe some centrist uh, Democrats or uh, some Democrats that were in Trump swing districts. Uh, that we're going to jump maybe over into the non-impeachment side. Uh, it appears as though that kind of that, that story is kind of going away, and that House Democrats are lining up together, except for the uh, congressman out of New Jersey who is uh, flipping parties and going uh, to the Republican side side of the aisle. Can we expect any Democrats in the Senate uh, maybe to to flip and uh, and vote with the Republicans on uh, acquitting the president? Yeah, good question. So let me take that in, in, in two parts. On the House side, we know there are 31 Democratic members from districts that Trump won in 2016. It appears as of last night, you know, half or, or maybe two thirds of those members have now said they're going to support impeachment. Um, you know, I imagine if they're smart, they were polling this issue over the weekend and they ultimately made that decision. Um, but that still leaves, you know, five or 10 Democrats in an uncertain category. And if they haven't announced it yet, it makes you wonder, you know, where they're going to end up. One thing to watch is you might have a handful of House Democrats who vote, uh, vote to impeach on abuse of power and vote uh, not to impeach on obstruction of Congress. Uh, in the Senate, uh, absolutely, I, I think you're going to have at a minimum one, uh, one vote to acquit from a Democrat, and that's Joe Manchin, Democrat of West Virginia. And I would watch two others. Um, I, I, would, I would absolutely uh, watch Doug Jones, the uh, so-called moderate Democrat from really red state Alabama, who's up for re-election in 2020. He won in that fluky special election uh, with Roy Moore, where the party really kind of, you know, uh, you know kind of uh, gave him up uh, for dead. Uh, and then the third person to watch is Kristen Sinema, uh, the fairly independent, somewhat moderate, 
Democratic senator from Arizona, uh, who is a bit of a contrarian. She kind of goes her own her own path. Yeah. So I think there's as many as three uh, Democratic senators who could ultimately vote to acquit. May end up only being one or two. But either way, you're going to have bipartisan opposition to impeachment in the House and the Senate. Do, do you see any Republicans going over to the Democrat side? I really don't. In the Senate, I really don't. I know there's questions about Mitt Romney and Susan Collins and Lisa Murkowski and maybe even Cory Gardner from Colorado. Uh, you know, all either sort of not Trump fans or moderates or people who are in cycle and vulnerable states. I really think you know, the Republicans held together in the House. Keep in mind, you have all those kinds of members in the House, too. You have retiring members. You have people who don't like Trump. You have moderates. You have people in tough districts. They all united. Uh, and then not only did they not, are they not going to support impeachment tomorrow, but they didn't even support the, the inquiry vote, which is just to say, let's, in, let's learn more and let's investigate because the process is so one-sided. So, no, I don't, I don't really, really, really would be surprised if any Republicans in the Senate ultimately support removal from office. That is just such a harsh remedy. Uh, it's one thing to impeach and then leave it to the Senate. It's another to say, no, this president needs to be removed from office because of the harm he's done to the country. And we have to, you know, basically undermine the results of the election, particularly when we're, what, 11 months, 10 months from the election by January. Yeah. Uh, Matt, uh, this, this is our last visit before the uh, before 2020. So I, I do want to, you know, uh, maybe get a couple of predictions from you. As of right now, and maybe this is not so, so much prediction as it just as we're looking at it right now. But who do you think is the is is best in line for the Democrats to win the nomination in 2020? I wish I had a pithy answer to that, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, Chad. I really, I really do. I, I was saying this yesterday to a group in Dallas. I think there are four or five people that are in, you know, a, a category by themselves where they all could be the nominee. And there's really not much distance between all of them. I mean, there was a story yesterday in the Hill that Bernie Sanders is surging in Iowa, yeah. right? I don't think any of us really probably think Bernie is going to be the nominee, but I think maybe he's an undervalued stock right now, um, potentially. You know, Warren will, will peak and has now come back down to earth. Buttigieg seems to be surging, but he's got you know big problems with black voters, and if he can't win solid numbers of black voters, he's not going to be the Democratic uh, nominee. So. You know, Biden, you know, we, we all think he's weak and he makes mistakes and he's not a lot of enthusiasm. But, boy, his polling numbers seem really steady. So I, I don't know. It seems to me, uh, you know, Buttigieg is, is, a, is a rising stock. I think Amy Klobuchar might surprise people in Iowa. She spent more time there than anyone, and she's a very, very good fit for that state. So I know that's not a short answer, uh, and it's not a bold prediction. But I, I really don't feel like I could even say one person is more likely than the others are the first five I mentioned. Do, do you think it's it's it, it's a, a real possibility of a brokered convention? I do. I appreciate you leading that way because I, I meant to bring that up. And th- listen, the reason there's two reasons why I think that's, that's more likely than it's been in recent years. Uh, one is what I just pointed to, the fact there are four or five people that are all in the first tier at this point, and none of them really have a significant advantage over the others. The second reason is Democrats allocate delegates proportionally. Republicans allocate delegates uh, on a, on a uh, winner-take-all basis. Uh, that's a big difference. And so I, I actually do think it's very unlikely one person will have a majority of the delegates going into the convention. Now, there may be someone who's in a lead who has, you know, uh, 42 percent of the delegates or 40 percent of the delegates. And they ultimately get there by choosing a VP nominee who brings delegates with them or someone drops out or whatever, endorses, you know, whatever. But I think there's a pretty good chance it could. It, we're, I don't think we're going to have a Democratic nominee until May at the earliest. And it very well may go all the way to the convention. Hmm. Very, very good. Matt, uh, tell folks how they can sign up for your newsletter and your podcast. Yeah, the newsletter is called Must Read Texas. We take all the top news from around the state, put it in one uh, summary email, sent over 3,000 uh, email inboxes by 9 a.m. every weekday morning. You can sign up for a free one-week trial at mustreadtexas.com. The podcast is called Mac on Politics. Uh, most recent uh, episode is a really fascinating conversation with an opposition figure, uh, who's in exile in Iran, and he talks about why the protests are going on in that country right now. You can find the podcast on iTunes, on Google Play, on Stitcher, uh, on Spotify, and on MacronPoliticsPodcast.com. All right, uh, Matt, appreciate all you've contributed to the show this year, and uh, we'll visit with you again in 2020. Hey, have a great break. Uh, Merry Christmas. Happy holidays to all your listeners, and I'll talk to you next year. All right, Merry Christmas. That's uh, Matt McCoviak here on the Chad Easty Show News Talk, KFYO.